out in session. If we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good flag. Good flag. Good flag. Good flag. Good flag. We can remain standing with we'll the staff moment of silence for the anniversary of the Sandy Hook shooting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the November 9th? I mean. I move to approve the minutes from the November. Never yeah, the Second by three. Uh, you know, before we do that, let's uh, meet our new uh, administrative assistant here. Gabrielle? Gabrielle, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Hi. Hi. We'll be dealing with you. Uh, Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Looking forward to it. Nice to meet you. Long time no see. Long time. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations on Thank you. Thank you. Okay, traffic survey. Survey number one. Mill Plain Road. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, survey number one location. Mill Plain Road oh, at right between right Duck Farm Road and Walvin Court. <laughs> Nature okay. request oh, to okay. install in street. Oh, hold on. We didn't approve the mess. Oh, I'll go back. I move. Ambrose, no, you're not speaking loud enough. Okay. Went really quick. Let's move on. Move All on. in favor? <laughs> okay. And yeah. Traffic <laughs> survey number one location: Mill Plain Road, at between Duck Farm Road and Walvin Court. Nature request: install in street sandwich board, formerly traffic barrel stop for pedestrians, and crosswalk crosswalk sign. Riverfield School Main Crosswalk. Additional feature may include yield payment markings, cross hatched shoulder, and bright strip reflectors for existing signs. Recommendation Bill Plain Road Crosswalk Board Sign approved as a pilot program to determine feasibility. By whom? William Hurley, Town Engineer. Okay, Commissioners, want to comment? Oh. I uh, I met with uh, uh, Bill Hurley uh, on uh, Thursday of last week, and I discussed this uh, concept. And he said that the actual um, sign the, the, that's in the middle of the road um, would have to be removed during the winter, at snowstorms and things like that, I think two hours to uh, to knock down. So it's a question of of uh, it's not a permanent location. Uh, my understanding is that it's a location that's going to be used for a period of time and then, then be moved. I mean, is, is, do we have more information on that? No, so how come oh, you are? Yeah. What? Go up? Bill, come on up. Sure. Uh, Bill Hurley, uh, Fairfield Engineering Manager. Um, regarding that uh, proposal is the mid-block, we call a mid-block crosswalk, and the pedestrian sign. The police commission or the town has had a policy in place since at least 2007 where the sign would be put up and then taken away during non-events. We've had recent uh, requests to leave them up more permanent than that. Uh, I wanted to check with our DPW and a couple of other departments to see if that would present a problem. The problem where well, the only issue that DPW had given me is that during, when we start getting some snowstorms, even this one here, <coughs> the dusting or whatever, that, that's all right. But if you get, say, three or six inches, and then uh, the plows <coughs> go around the sign, and then all of a sudden, a day or two later, if a Canadian high comes and the temperatures drop, now all of a sudden, that little bit of snow becomes hard ice. And that would be somewhat dangerous for the uh, pedestrians. And they don't want to have to go back and, you know, clear that out and all that. So either right before a storm, again, this is relatively of a new policy if we decide to leave it permanently, is where, you know, before, before the first major storm, say, then they would have to take it out. And then if they wanted to still keep it, say, in January, February, March, they'd have to bring it in and out like they, they're supposed to do anyway. 
Um, and so that's where that came. Where, as I said, uh, we had gotten a lot of requests from uh, bike and ped group at the time and uh, a couple of residents on Mill Plain Road. Well, you know, it's nice that that crosswalk's used for school, but it's also used other times of the day. Can we leave it up more permanently? And then concurrently, I had gotten this uh, from uh, the old post road, uh, St. Paul's. And uh, let me just uh, <clears throat> read this real quick, if you don't mind. In the last week, we have witnessed four thoughtless drivers totally disregard ourselves and our teachers as we've pulled the crosswalk signs in and out. This problem is getting worse, and it's only a matter of time before one of us gets hit. Often drivers see us and pause or slow, but as we place the sign down, just as one's head is at bumper height, they proceed to drive around you. Putting these signs in and out puts us in danger four times a day. So that was one of the ones. Now, eventually, long term, uh, we're working on it right now to do those RRFBs uh, where we would have a special crosswalk light there. Um, and we've worked with town halls, uh, St. Paul's, and the first congregational church, I believe, or first church. And we've all come up, and some RTM members, uh, select women as well, and, and came up with a neighbor and the police department uh, neighborhood plan. And so that was one you might recall. I think it was approved about six months ago, but the wheels of government take flow. And actually, full disclosure, we got a grant for that one. And the state said, yeah, we're looking at about, I think it was 2026 or 27 that we'd be able to put it in. We're like, we got to put it in sooner than that at this location. And so that would be resolved, but that's still probably by the time the handicap ramps and the actual uh, signs get put in, it's probably three or four months. So um, uh, they're still going to be using this. But I wanted to highlight there's a little bit more pressure to kind of revise our put it in place and then take out only at, you know, at certain times to, to a more permanent situation. So that's where, that's where we would go. And the other thing that I would stress is, because again, some things pop up even during our survey, there was some, uh, a garbage truck that came and kind of popped it up. Or as I said, maybe this uh, a situation would come in where um, uh, the sign would have helped the, uh, the uh, crossing guard with their, with their stop sign, because now you have basically his sign and that sign, so that either side of the road you'd be able to see it and stuff like that. So I think uh, the best way, if the commission was a little hesitant on approving it forever, uh, you could possibly put it as a pilot program is, is another option that was discussed with the survey team. And we kind of do like a six or eight month trial, I'll leave it up to you guys, where we would have, you know, we talk to the crossing guard, does this make a difference? Uh, if we do it with St. Paul, you know, was this uh, uh, a better solution, things like that. Uh, ultimately, um, we always get requests for school zones and stuff like that. I checked with the Board of Ed. They actually have about 10 of these signs. So we could even expand it further. Uh, for those locations, I'd probably say let's wait until after the winter and we get a little trial here. But come springtime, if the permanent thing seems to work a little bit better, then maybe expand it to the school zones. That would be the, the uh, premise. Yep. Sure. Who would be responsible, Bill, for installing and removing? Well, that's the thing. We originally we thought somebody from the school, PTA, or or, or in this case St. Paul's, it was their own workers. Uh, there's getting we're getting. A into traffic and put these signs in and take them out. And that's been confirmed by the Board of Ed. But we're going to approve this. Should we not designate that some entity? Well, that would, be, that would be the thing of, you know, perhaps if it's, quote, once or twice a year that they're doing it, you know, then that would be something that they would look into or I would request DPW. I don't think DPW wants to do it. We would prefer somebody, uh, whether it be PTA or, or from the school. But obviously saying that, instead of 250 times a day, or, or actually times two, 500 times a year going out versus two or four times, at least the probability situation gets uh, reduced severely. So what's your, what's your recommendation as to who to designate 
the, the, the job to. Well, I would, I would still put it on, on the schools or, or whatever neighborhood association, PTA, whoever, you know, uh, is willing to do it. As I said, it would only be a couple of times a year, most likely, unless they wanted to continue it during the winter months, you know, when there's, you know, possibility of snow or whatever. Then it would be still up to the schools or the church or whoever to do it. It's just that during the summer months, spring, summer, and fall months, it would be a little bit more permanent when you're having more pedestrian activity. That's not to say that there's no pedestrian activity in the winter, but at least we could justify saying that, you know what, you have less unless it's a high volume area with a school or a church where they're still going to be. Yeah, basically that would be the, the case. I would recommend to, to at least do that to give you a little bit of wiggle room if we have some unexpected problem. These crosswalk signs are a proven traffic safety measure. Uh, from uh, the Highway Safety uh, Board, and so I, I think it, it, it's a good idea. But just like everything else, you know, a specific location may pose a problem we hadn't thought of, but then it might also be, you know what, it worked out pretty good. Yeah, there are a lot of towns, Weathersfield, Newtown, uh, there's a couple other ones uh, I know of uh, that leave them up permanently even year-round. Uh, we would be somewhere like in the middle, if you know what I mean. Um, oh, sure. Where's the liability if somebody's trying to take it out and pull it in? Is that going to be something that's for the community? I really don't know. To me, it would be the same. It would be no different in terms of liability if they were walking across the street. The fact that they have a sign, you know, or their, quote, responsibility, and that's where, again, by leaving it more permanent, I think we've reduced that chase as much as we can. Because the other way is if we left them up permanent 24-7, 365 days, then you might pose a problem, you know, not liability-wise with, uh, with somebody taking in and out of the sign, but with weather conditions or if a pedestrian uses a crosswalk and the plow had to go around the sign and they slip on the ice, well, then there's another. So it's, it's kind of a probability or kind of a risk management kind of situation. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, any other things the commission? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Bill, thanks. Hi, Kevin. On that specific topic, can we get an opinion from the town attorney on that liability response? Sure, uh, and, and we uh, we have a new, I believe we have a risk manager or assistant. Whoever it is. Yeah, I could do that, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that would be important for me to get comfortable with whatever level we end up mm -hmm. out there, just to understand it. It sounds like a good thing, but it sounds like also it's something that could expand down the road and kind of get away from us if we let it. Right, and again, having this stuff mentioned in the, the minutes or, or if, if it ends up getting approved, hey, you know, we can't be zero, you know, or 100% sure of something or zero, eliminate the liability to zero. But looking at it's better, it's safer, we've reduced as much as we can. Uh, we still recommend, you know, certain, you know, things of at least putting it in and out, you know, or before a storm, then um, we, we've, we've done the best that we can. And I would think that would have something positive for the town if it ever came to a court thing or something like that. Mr. Stone, you have a question? Mm -hmm. gotcha. I, a point, actually, I think, uh, I think the pilot program makes some sense uh, since I live in the Mill Plain area and I'm familiar with the traffic and everything that goes on down there. Mm -hmm. Not a pretty scene some mornings. So I think the pilot program makes some sense. But I would also say that we should designate the Board of Education should have the responsibility for the placement and removal of that sign. I get a little nervous thinking about some mother or father from the PTA having that responsibility with no... Mm -hmm. you know, well, yeah, no, as I said, I was just I, using that as an example because I know that there are some school unions that were against it, but there's others, or the upper management can somehow figure it out, I guess. Yeah, yep. You're only doing okay. it a couple of times a year. It's right, what that's we're right. About. It's not a big deal. That's right. It's a tremendous... As we were mentioning before, rather than 500 times, if you're doing it a couple times, two, four, six, whatever, uh, you know, uh, even if it's if they happen to take it in and out just during the winter months, that's still maybe 90 versus 500. So you reduce the chances significantly, and uh, that that's a good point. Okay, yeah. That's I mean, the, the maintenance crews they have their own trucks. They could put one out like the highway department does as a as a warning vehicle while somebody runs out and. Does the swing. Mm -hmm. and, and and if it is if it is a, that's a good point. If it is a problem with the board of ed, perhaps, and I can't speak for another department, 
uh, the Department of Public Works would do it. But I could definitely tell you, they don't want, they don't have the manpower to be doing it every day and this and that. And for them to do it, like even just using this Mill Plain Road, but let's say there's another one that we end up approving in Stratfield, one of the schools up there, to have somebody come all the way from there, all the way up and back. Now we're talking it's over an hour, which is something that would have taken somebody a lot closer, five minutes, you know, so that, that's a good point. Uh, but then again, if the DPW ended up doing that, or you know, they would probably do it like once or twice. The They're D not going to do it. I'm not saying the DPW. No, no, I'm just saying if the Board of Ed had an issue with it. Uh, but then it would be um, it would be a lot less. Uh, mm -hmm. DPW would do it probably one time a year, if you know what I mean. So. I'm most at all. Okay, so. Uh, but the Board of Ed is a good idea. Commissioner, I highly recommended you check with the town attorney. Mm hmm. Do we need to do that before we pass this, or can we um, continue? Yeah, because if the town attorney says no, well then, so we can, yeah. So we can make a motion to, if we want to make a motion to approve this as, as a pilot program um, contingent on the town attorney. To be reviewed in six months? Well, the, pilot program. Well, the pilot program, do you want to revisit? It, it's kind of open-ended with a pilot program. Yeah, I mean, well, we want the town attorney's opinion. Right. After that, if you get back to us, <clears> we need <throat> a motion. Uh, how about you, Commissioner you want to make a motion? To, to approve the pilot program that's in front of us and is subject to the yeah. town attorney's review of the plan. Correct. As to the liability issue. As to the liability mm -hmm. issue. Okay. We have a second. And are you Wait, setting a term on the? Are you saying a term on a pilot program? Is that what you're asking, uh, Commissioner? A six-month term? I don't know. I, I suggest a six-month term, but I, I leave it open. open. I think open. Open-ended. Yeah. Okay. Well, we would provide reports, as you know. I, but, usually, somebody from engineering. Board of Ed should be in monthly. There, a responsible party for moving that sign. Well, I think the town attorney will advise us. I'll second the motion. Okay. Second by Commissioner Millington. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Survey two locations: Sasco Hill Road at between Harbor Road. Nature of request: Applicant has purchased a speed sign to locate in front of their home at 210 Sasco Hill Road. Proposes to install a sign by the utility pole just north of the driveway at 210 Sasco Hill Road. Recommendation to be discussed further by whom, Chris Russo? Okay, uh, before we do it, do the commissioners have any comments? Not yet, okay, you're on. Chairman, commissioners, good to be uh, before you uh, tonight as always. Uh, Chris Russo with Russo Rizzio LLC, offices at 10 Sasco Hill Road uh, in, in Fairfield, um, just north of where this sign is proposed. Uh, by my client uh, who's already purchased the sign. It's sitting in her, her garage, a uh, solar-powered speed sign um, that she's looking uh, to place. Uh, the, the area that you had indicated was the one she, she thought would be the best, but, um, uh, and, and we'll talk about this, but she, uh, she really was going to leave it to the discretion of this, this commission if there was a location uh, that they found more appropriate between Sasco Hill Road and Oldfield Road. Uh, the issue is, and I'm, I know you've all been up and down Sasko Hill Road 10,000 times, but from Sasko, uh, from Post Road going up Sasko Hill Road, there's that steep incline. And what happens is, is to get up that hill, a lot of vehicles, and I see it every day because that's where my office is right at that corner, people will floor it to get up that hill. And then when they get to Harbor Road, it kind of crests and they're already gunning it and they tend to just keep flooring it and speed down to Old Field Road. Um, and uh, Sasko Hill Road has actually turned into a bit of a cut through, uh, especially at this time. It's what I took uh, to get here from Sasko Hill Road. Uh, because going through downtown is, is usually impossible during this time of day, uh, a lot of people that are heading east come down Sasko Hill Road and then go down old fields. So it sees quite a bit of traffic. Uh, but in addition to that, it's also a road that sees a lot of bikers 
uh, and sees a lot of um, runners, people walking. Um, and the issue with that road, there's no sidewalks. A lot of the, uh, the space off the road, um, a lot of properties have stone walls that have been there for a long time. It tends to be a very narrow area. And then uh, there's also a lot of telephone poles. So the vehicles, the bikers, the runners are frequently kind of competing with each other. And it makes for a, a dangerous situation. Um, on top of that, on the western side of Sasco Hill Road, so the, the portion that's facing the harbor, there is a pretty steep grade change. So there's a lot of driveways on that side where it, it pitches down really severely and quickly. So those, um, a lot of the cars coming out of those driveways are not leveled off, uh, so the sight lines aren't that great. So there's just a lot of issues in this section from the, uh, Post Road to Old Field Road. So with that, my client kind of just took the initiative. Um, she's also a walker uh, that, that goes up and down the road. She kind of took the initiative in trying to get the speed sign, which she's happy to, um, to give to the town uh, to be able to install. Um, I have some pictures, again, even though I know you know this road well, just to kind of illustrate those points. <clears throat> I learned that from attorney Ben, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the first picture is that, that that steep grade change going up as you're coming from the post road, getting towards Harbor Road, and then at the intersection with Harbor Road, where really that's where people tend to pick up because that's where it starts to level off there. Um, and that the next picture where you see the share the road sign, and, and you'll see if you flip through these pictures, there's a number of signs in this section on both sides of the road, heading northbound and southbound, warning that there's bikers, warning that there's, there's walkers. Um, and the, it's the fourth picture, you'll see a utility pole. That's originally where uh, it, it's what has been proposed as the location for the speed sign. Um, but again, if this commission, um, and I think the lieutenant might comment to this as well, if you felt that there was a better location uh, along this portion of Sasco Hill Road, we would certainly be open to that. Chris, how far is that utility uh, pole from the post road, approximately? For the post road, I mean, it's really more from that Harbor Road intersection. Yeah. I would say it's probably... Probably 75 feet, 75 feet, nor, 75 feet from the harbor road. Yes. Yeah, or after as you're going out. And so that it would be south of the harbor road intersection. Yeah. yeah, that that's where we were proposing because the issue is, and you can see in one of the pictures when you when you get over that crest, you can see the stop sign for Oldfield Road in the distance, and it's kind of like that's where I need to get to go. So yeah, I, I'm at point A, I need to get to point B. I'm frustrated because of the traffic, so I'm gonna haul it to, that, to there. And so the hope was is that we had a speed sign there. You know, I, and, and I know obviously there's, there's some people who you know, would ignore speed signs, but it does send kind of a subconscious, <laughs> subconscious thought to people that you're getting your speed checked. So even just laying off the, the the throttle or, you know, just for a second, just, just to dial it back that hopefully in this short stretch uh, that, that it would slow people down and have an impact. Uh, you'll see there's a number of pictures here. I was just trying to, and it's tough to show in pictures, but I, I know you've all been by there, so you know that these driveways do pitch down. And then the, the last few pictures are just showing, and this is, on, again, on both sides of the road, but there's, there's a bike route sign, there's a slow children sign, there's a share the road sign. There's another bike route sign. There's there's just a number of signs there because uh, you know it's it's used by a lot of different I guess modes of transportation you'd say, um, and it can also at times get complicated because I I've you know walked up and down that road. Um, there's a lot of landscapers that that work in that area. Their vehicles are sometimes parked on Sasco Hill Road. So you're getting around that as well. 
uh, it, it can really it, it can turn into a, to a mess. So the sign, and I don't, I, I'm not sure. If, did, did you all get a copy of what the sign looks like that they're that they're looking to install? Because I have that. You know, okay. So if you've seen it in your packet, it's just in, in you know standard speed sign. Uh, it's solar powered, so it doesn't have to keep getting the battery replaced. Um, and my client has gone to. Uh, a number of neighbors. I don't know if you've got the latest. I have these, and I'll just hand them out because this is the latest. Um, yeah, um, <coughs> two neighbors. Yeah. yeah, this this is quite an extensive list of neighbors up and down Sasco Hill Road. They all obviously deal with the same issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah the people were not near your house. <laughs> there, there was there were people up and down. We actually we have a number of clients that are. Uh, that live on Sasco Hill Road. Um, you know, this very interesting. Yeah, it could be the same one, but I want to make sure. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, and I, I know um, I spoke to Lieutenant Irizarry, and he asked us to contact our more immediate neighbors to make sure they were okay with it. Four of those neighbors sign. I, I there's one neighbor um, that I know. Uh, had some comments. I didn't receive those comments, but I, I talked to the tenant about it. I think there was some concern with seeing the sign, uh, you know, in the in the, in the flashing numbers. Um, you know, obviously the intent is for it to point north, so point towards Post Road and not point towards any house. Uh, you know, I understand it's probably angled a little bit, so you, you might be able to see it. But um, and, and that's, again, why we're open. If there was a neighbor that was opposed to that specific location. If there's a, the other neighbors were comfortable with the sign being in front of their property um, uh, that signed on this. So it could be moved to, to that location, uh, to one of those locations as well. Okay. Um, you have temporary We did. We experimented with a number of locations for the chief's order. Um, we tried both north and south of Harbor Road, and I see no issue with that immediate area. However, uh, in light of that, I was recently brought to the attention that 209 Sasco had an issue with the sign being across from their home uh, because they have a clear sight line with that sign. I understand that residence in this moment has a right to order one to make the shoot before we close. Sure. Um, oh, no, no, yeah. Your name and uh, address. Yep. Uh, my name is Pamela Lamana. I live at 209 Sasco Hill Road across the way uh, from the neighbor petitioner who has organized some of this. Um, I actually only learned about all of it officially on um, Monday, I believe. I, they left a petition uh, form with us on Friday, and um, I actually had my mother-in-law coming in town, so I really didn't get back to him until Monday. And at any rate, when I learned about it, I spoke to him, and strangely, we do live in close proximity, but I rarely ever see the neighbors because, um, well, there's, you know, you just don't always get across the street. And it is a busy road, as mentioned. Um, but we've been there about five years, and I've observed that definitely there is definitely uh, an increase a little bit in um, speed, the speeding, and we go to check our mail. Sometimes there's definitely, you know, you can be a little bit nervous. But I also feel that I walk a lot, too, and I was listening to what they said. I walk a lot, too, but I always walk down to the harbor and I take our dog because I don't feel Sasco is a walking road. Um, so my concern really is obviously safety and traffic. I know those are paramount for everybody in the area. My concern was when I learned about it at such a late date, so much had been done prior and we lived directly across the street. I felt like, uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. I felt like it would have been nice to be looped in a little bit sooner. Um, I heard maybe two weeks ago when I saw the electric sign, a neighbor a couple doors down when it was placed in front of her yard, she mentioned it to me. Um, and perhaps I should be keeping up on more things in the neighborhood, but I'm definitely not up on all of it. Uh, and one thing I noticed on the petition was that, this is the stuff that I get through the dogs and walking the dog, is that um, a neighbor on one of the side roads mentioned that the petitioner had put in three rows of hydrangeas and that there was really not much of a walkway anymore and they asked if we were going to do the same and I said we had no plans to do such a thing and that I actually thought they were really pretty and I was really very unaware of it and they had contacted someone to get a row of them removed so they could walk. So when I saw the petition, I was a little confused. You know, it's the electric sign. You know, they said it so that there's no walkways, but they're impeding on the walkway. So I was a little confused. I'm like, what is the end, end, you know, end 
reason really for this is, in, is it because they've got a challenging driveway. I think we all want people to slow down on the road, and I'm even nervous checking my mail sometimes. But I guess for me, one of the my one I guess the question I have in my mind is the electric sign the only option? I would like people to slow down, but is that our only option? You know, large sign, and I think it opens it up for more like commercial signs such as that. You know, anywhere. And does it open the door to more of that? And are the speed zones, are electric or uh, solar, are these signs doing that much? And those are my questions, you know. And I felt like maybe they're coming to the table with more, you know, more signatures. Had I had more time, maybe I would have asked around. But I'm not opposed in any way to my neighbor petitioning for this. I was a little confused when I read it. And again, some of it was like honest gossip that I got through. Someone walking their dog told me that they didn't like the row because it the row of uh, rhododendrons because it blocked the walkway. And then when I read the petition sign, it said, because we don't have sidewalks. So anyway, I'd really just like to get to the heart of it. And, you know, is it because someone has a challenging driveway and they maybe could cut their hedges back so that they could see better because, you know, we had asked a neighbor of ours because we have a, dr a driveway. We had asked our neighbor to maybe move the, set the tree back so we could see, you know, going in and out. And it is. I know, and I also am aware that there was a stop sign um, right, that has since been removed when we did move in. And I, you know, the cars used to back up in front of our driveway, but they did slow down. Um, and we didn't say anything about it, but one day I think the sign, the stop sign was removed. So I was curious to learn what happened. And so, I don't know, I wanted to learn a little bit more, so that's why I came to attend, because I really am just learning about it. And it sounds like, you know, it's been, they've been on it for a little while, and I would have liked to learn more about it sooner. That's all. So I don't know if you guys can answer any of those questions, well, if anyone knows about the stop sign. Survey, which happens a couple weeks before. Sorry? You know, you get, you get the survey, there were only two names on the survey. On the so, survey? Um, oh. There were two neighbors named up the street. So Lieutenant Harris Derry got a hold of the attorney, Attorney Bruce, and look, the commission's questioning who wants to sign. Yeah. That's why they came back with another people that's fine if I had time I maybe would have inquired as well and I, listen I understand that the safety is paramount and that's the number one priority getting people to slow down I guess for me is the electric and solar sign our only option but you understand you are concerned also with the safety issue there well I think yeah at times I see cars do come come down there fast but there was once a stop sign and I was kind of curious what happened to the stop sign um, you know I'm not I'm I am a little bit in opposition of a of an electric street sign, to be honest, so or solar. That yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not overly concerned to the point where I would have gone and done something about it, but in truth, um, you know, so I don't see it being a huge issue. It's not an issue for us, but I'm in strong opposition of, you know, having a large, you know, electric sign right nearby and what it opens it up for. Well, Stop sign. She said it was moved. I don't know where that. Um, I've been with the town 32 years. I have to admit, I don't know. Exactly. Do you know the location of the stop sign? Uh, the town? It's Tyne Mill Terrace. Tyne Mill Terrace. It's right on. It was right, right across from the intersect of Harbor and Sasco Hill. It was right there. Oh, so the stop sign was on Tyne Mill Terrace. It was never on Sasco Hill. I think Hill. it was on Sasco. It was right at the corner. Yeah, they wouldn't have been on Sasco Hill. Oh, maybe it was on. But, yeah, it, it, but it stopped because they they backed up right in front of our driveway. Do you want to cars make a left turn? Yeah. Or something. Yeah. Back it up at the turn. Right. To, be honest, no, to be honest with you, yes, in order to either put in a stop sign or take out a stop sign, it has to go before the police commission. Mm. Anything to do with signs, pavement markings, uh, has to go uh, before the police commission. And like I said, um, something I, was there. Uh, the only other thing it could have been is if there was a sign on Tide Mill for Minor Road. Maybe you know, it was on Tide Mill. And the BBW hasn't put on. So uh, I, I I will throw it by DPW or we even have a sign inventory of where mm -hmm. the signs are. Great. And I'll take a look. If there was one there, then they can replace it. Mm -hmm. And they can't put a new one in without going to the commission. Sure, okay. okay. All righty. Sure. Okay, so, um, so you're in opposition to the sign. That's clear. <laughs> um, well, not really. I'm not 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Was okay. there another option? And, and what location will it be at? Well, like, like not, your, not the... Commissioner Pine, yes. I, the, the um, sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, and we did have two stop signs on Sasco Hill Road a few years ago at the intersection of Old Fields as a traffic calming measure. The, um, I think one, one thing that may arise here is that um, this sign looks a lot different than the signs that Fairfield people are used to. So I think if we improve this, we should 
maybe do it on a trial basis, because some of these people who sign this may think it's that little teeny box and not really know. And if they see a bigger sign with solar panel, they may change their mind. So maybe we should, uh, you know, what I would suggest is giving it a trial period of two, two or three months, have the traffic division find a place to put this where it's not directly across from 209 when they look out uh, their their window, and then we can see what the rea real reaction of the neighbors are to this sign, since it is different than the one that the town currently owns. Um, and go from there. I mean, if there's no complaints at that point, then we can make it permanent. But I think it, it will give the neighbors some time, and especially neighbors that have no idea. Because there, I mean, there's a lot of people that live on Sasquatch Hill Road, and I'm sure they don't all answer their doors. So. Um, as far as the process that we use to get where we are today, I mean, I, I know it, it appears that the homeowner came forward with the issue and with the offer to purchase and place the sign and all that stuff, right, based on all the meetings. But other than that, what process What's, what, what's been different about the process that we've used to get here today than what we would normally have done when something was just identified and, and brought forward? So, the situation, the residents had already purchased the sign prior to receiving any approvals, obviously. Right. Since then, what I did was I sent the attorney a memorandum of agreement which stipulates the conditions of this sign. Um, it says that they, they are to acquire the sign at their own expense. They're going to donate it to the police department. Uh, the town will agree to install that solar powered display sign in the area of 210 Pasco. But that is at our discretion. And the town agrees to maintain the sign in proper working order for a period not to exceed 10 years and a repair is not to exceed 1,000 per fiscal year. So these stipulations, I still have yet to receive them back need to be signed by all residents that purchased the sign, mm -hmm. and then the chief, if approved by you. Thank you very much. That was exactly my That's question. Right. That was exactly my question. Um, have we done this before? Have we had? Have we ever done this before where somebody wanted something, offered to buy something, and went through the same process, or yeah. is this a brand new type thing? I believe Fairfield Beach Road Association did a very similar contract, as well as uh, okay. South Benson Road. I was not familiar with it happening sure. quite this way, yep. and I didn't know if maybe if this was the first time or are we setting some kind of precedent for people all over town to just raise their hand and say, hey, I, I've got 2000 bucks, I want this in my front yard and do it. I'm just trying to knock it down that rat hole, if you will. Sure. So, can we talk about that? No. No. I think what, what the lieutenant said, Church will be true, and I know that was a a partnership with them. I believe Fairfield Country Day School, too, uh, was also another partnership. I remember going up and changing the batteries. We maintain it, but they bought the sign, I believe. Um, I wasn't in that division at the time, but yeah, it's not. I mean, we still have to approve the need, not just the want. Right. And, and do they lose their flavor when there's 30 of them around town? We're not there yet. So, I mean, obviously, we have to be. I mean, it's kind of a legal question, I guess. I was trying to understand what happened and why and where it could lead us down the road. Yeah, there's South Pine, I know that, or South Benson, Fairfield Beach Road. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. So, in looking at the signed petitions, we do have yet signatures uh, further south from that area at 239, 251, and 258, which is just prior to Sasco Hill Terrace. So the sign would be just as effective at that location as the request of the official 210. And then it's not in the line of sight of the resident. So that might, right. And won't that satisfy you? I would appreciate that. Sure, yeah. I understand that they won't get this going on. Yeah, I'm not adverse to the installation of a sign because I think there is a safety issue there. The absence of sidewalks really requires uh, additional safety measures. What concerns me more than anything else is I think the process where, you know, as an individual, one can, it's almost self-serving 
to say, well, here, I'm going to go buy a sign, and uh, we hope you accept it. I would, I would hope that uh, the process like that, it would come before the police commission first, before they went out and bought a sign. Well, so, That's well, the, qu the qu originally how, it, and, that, and this is what I was going to respond to, originally how it started was my client thought that they owned past their stone wall. So they thought their property did not end at their, if you look at that picture, so they didn't know if they could just install it on their property. But then they contacted me and I had, I've done a bunch of different things for them with this property. And I looked at their site plan. I said, no, well, actually, I, your property line ends at your stone wall. So you don't have any area outside of that. So, but we looked at it and one of the things that is nice and different than some of the other properties is there's a utility pole and if you look at there's one picture where you see the utility pole in the midst of the hydrangea bushes and by the way we're working with the tree ward on those high, hydrangea bushes that, that we're talking so that that was all well, attorney lesser in our office and the tree ward were working on those bushes we had a we had an overzealous landscaper who planted too far out but we that that's that's gone because again my clients walk uh down this road as well um but so this utility pole is set right up against the stone wall. So we thought there was an area there we could just kind of put it almost like right next to the utility pole to try to be discreet because it is a beautiful road and, 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 and you don't want to disturb that look. But if you look, there's another picture where you're see, you will see a number of utility poles and they are almost right on the road. And so in those locations, it seemed like it might be a little bit more difficult to kind of, quote unquote, hide this this speed sign or or kind of attach it to. So w because ours is further in, we thought it would be a good location for it. Well, not hide it, but just not to not to have another separate structure from pole. If a pole's there to have it right next to the pole, it seemed like it would be a good location because the utility pole's there to have it right next to it. So yeah, not hide obviously because it's got to serve a purpose, which is show people, but just visually to not keep breaking it up with utility pole sign, utility pole sign. That was uh, that was our from houses rather right. than the trap. Correct. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes, but we we are not installing this on any utility pole to prove on It'll get its own pole. Right, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying next to it. Like we were trying to see if we could group them next to each other, but not that it would be on the. It would be actually on the utility pole. Yeah. Uh, what percentage these signs? How long do they slow down speeding before they were annoyed? Well, I'm not sure as to the. I, I mean, we all very opinionated. I, we have two signs now that are provided by traffic logic that we got from the state grant. One on Villa, one on Mill Plain. The state told us to not leave those signs for more than 10 weeks because they lose their effect. Mm -hmm. People do. I live in Monroe, driving through Newtown on Holly Hill Road, if you're familiar with it. There's got to be eight of these signs on that road, right? There must be a police commissioner that lives in the sign. No one pays attention to those signs because they're just there. And I've been there four years now, and I've seen people whizzing by me on um, my rear end in a police car. You know what? So, I can take you back to that because I go to the South and I go to the and let me tell you something. Those lines are 45, 47, they flash red. Let me take a So, so what, what's the purpose of this? Well, the, the hope is to just get as many people as you can, I, obviously not all, that just be conscious of their speed. To, even if it's a subconscious thing where you see your, uh, you see your speed and maybe you don't care, or maybe you just have a, a, a kind of subconscious reaction to lay off the gas just for a little bit. Because again, this isn't a very long stretch here. I mean, the old field stop sign does come up, you know, relatively soon, but there, there is enough space where people really can pick up speed. So the hope would just be to kind of get them to lay off the throttle and then maybe not reach excessive speeds before they get to the old field sign. after the 10 weeks, like you talked about, do you move it to another location on the road? Or what do you do? Uh, our intent was just to, to, to just leave it there. That that was that was what we were... I live um, close to Fairfield Beach Road, and then it's, a, it's like a racetrack. Even when the sign, after the sign was up for a little bit, then it just lost all its effectiveness. So 
Well, and it's something we, we think is at least more, I mean, we, we haven't removed all speed limit signs, right? I mean, we have those signs and some people uh, pay attention to them, some people don't, yeah. but this is something that, you know, we've seen used a lot around. We, we start seeing more and more of these speed signs and hoping that they're more effective, even if it's slightly, uh, than, than what's there right now. Okay, so, um, what's your name again? Pam, Pamela. Pamela is not an objection to analysis, the sign's not part of your property. Commissioner Milligan made a good point about pilot programs, so uh, I'll make a motion. Well, can I make a statement oh. first? Sure. Um, oh, okay. well, yeah. yeah. Sure. I know this road is, is there's a lot of traffic on there. I do run my bike from Southport Beach. I don't really staff travel to all of which I go to. I know right. there's a problem there. However, I'm not really happy with the process on how we went about doing it. Um, but I just want to state it, and I feel bad for 209. She wasn't aware of it right away. Um, I think she should have been more informed um, from the neighborhood. Well, and, and, and just to respond to that, though, we, we were asked to submit a traffic survey request. We submitted the traffic survey request, and then we proactively started getting some signatures, and then Lieutenant Irizarry pointed out, can you, and, and we got a, a lot of signatures, and then Lieutenant Irizarry asked us to check on um, five address. I think it was five addresses, and so we... Uh, we met with four of them. We weren't able to connect um, uh, with the owner at 209, but we did connect with four, and they signed as well before this. And we submitted this, I think we submitted last week. So, I mean, everybody that we've been asked to reach out to, we tried to. We unfortunately reached um, our neighbor at 209. My client travels, and so she, uh, she was away for a little bit, um, but uh, her partner was able to reach out um, um, to the owner at 209. So I, I feel like we've we've done a lot of outreach to to try. If it's a question of more time, I mean we're happy to continue no, conversations the, with the neighbor. I, you know. Neighbors, I think what they're trying to say is that you submit a survey with two signatures who live half a mile from the the complaints or the petition, and uh, I think over well with the commission. He told the neighbor Jerry, then he contacted you to get more signatures from your neighbors. Okay, so when you're talking about the process, you probably should have. To make a request before buying a sign and get all the signatures a couple of weeks ago instead of backtracks. But I mean, that's what other issues come yeah. so that's a issue, right? Anyway, you have a. Do uh, 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 you want to get up? Yeah, I, got, I just wanted to say a couple of things here. Um, again, in the, the fourth picture where the, you can see a little walking path, so again, like they said, there were some pedestrians that walked there. I, if, if this is approved, I would say that it should be at least four, preferably five feet off the curb line at least, so that it doesn't interfere with pedestrian traffic. Uh, the other thing would be is if the commission does approve this as a pilot program and then for some reason it didn't work out or it's maybe tolerated but not as a permanent but more of a temporary, that would the clients be opposed to truly donating the sign to the town and then we could put it in our rotation system where it would go on SASCO but maybe only once or twice a year for those eight weeks at a time, not permanent, if, if the pilot was turned down. You know, that way they bought the sign already. If for some reason there's something that they would still be able to donate to the town and we would put it in a, I am with other. Okay. Uh, it's a part of my motion. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Well, so uh, th those were the only comments. The other is uh, when you know, talk about the effectiveness and all that. Again, it is somewhat of a uh, proven safety uh, feature. Uh, a lot of people might drive and not realize they're going as fast as what the sign says. Uh, but then you also get another component of, well, they don't care, or they might even be intense to, or uh, incentive to go even faster. Well, a lot of these signs, I'm not sure about this one in particular, but the ones the police department have purchased, after, say, 15 miles over the speed limit, it won't go any higher. So there's none of that incentive, let me, like our you know, baseball radar, oh, let me see how fast I can go. So that would have been the other thing. But uh, it is a proven safety, and I know in the past the commission has had uh, a couple of speeding or checking speeding requests. So I just wanted to bring up independent or a different view. So thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. So, 
apologize. Just to address Mr. Hurley's suggestion, in the memorandum of agreement, item number one, Kevin Nell and Sonia Lazar agreed to acquire at its own expense and donate one solar powered heat and place line to the town, which will then become a remain property of the town. So that should address that. Sure. Our, our client's comfortable with that. You know, okay. Purchasing a, a sign and donating it to, to the okay. town. Wait, are we waiting for the agreement? I still have not. Yet. Well, yeah, I mean, typically, I, I, I don't. I, typically, we have agreements with that with the town. Usually, it's a condition of approval, and then if it's approved, then you you sign an agreement. So you, that that's usually whenever we've had agreements between an applicant and the town, it's usually just been a condition of approval to execute. I also have that in, as part of my house. Okay. <laughs> so I have five parts of the motion. So, well, can I make the motion? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So All right. I make the motion that number one, accept the donation of the uh, traffic sign. Um, and that um, I was going to say that it could be rescinded if there wasn't permanent approval, but obviously we don't need that. So number one, accept the donation by the police department of the, the traffic sign. Number two, that the traffic units shall install and choose the location of the sign in consultation with the engineering department. Number three, that, they, that there be a two month trial period from, starting from the date of the installation. Number four, that there will be a vote for permanent approval at a date certain following the trial period by the commission. And uh, number five, um, all of this would be uh, based upon uh, uh, based upon the full execution of the uh, agreement between the owners of the property at 210 South Hill Road and the town of Fairfield, i.e. the police chief. Okay, we have a question. So we will review to make sure it's not near 209 instead of site 210. Yes. Thank you. Do you have a discussion on the motion? Yes. Well, it needs to be seconded first. I second it. All right. Second by Mr. Ambrose. Discussion? Yes. Just a question on the two month test period. When would you do this? Because I would think there'd be a different reaction to having that up in January and February versus April and May. Oh, I traffic would move at different speeds. I, I think that the two month trial period that we're discussing is going to be mostly based upon the appearance of the signs. It's so different than any other sign we have. This is a sign that, that doesn't just digitally show your speed. It shows that it's got a white background with a, with a traffic sign and a solar panel attached to it. So it's, that's what the two-month trial period is. See if neighbors who are unaware or neighbors who initially said yes, but then they see what the sign actually looks like and then determine that they don't like it. Uh, okay. Well, what's, what's the, but isn't the purpose of the sign to slow down the traffic? Well, I don't think we're going to determine whether traffic slows because the sign's there or not. Um, it's just it's another. Look, what have we like, been talking about? But it's like putting up a, a 25 mile an hour speed sign. We don't go back later and say, does it work? You know, it, it's it's a digital speed sign. It's just like a, a posted traffic sign. This one's just digital. But I think the appearance is what people, especially on a, a, a street like South Hill Road, are going to really take. Um, well, I think the police are going to need to check. You're going to check the effects of the sign also. As part of it. Yeah, what I could do, I could propose to the commission based on your approval within that trial period, we could do a traffic survey with the black cat to determine its effectiveness. Yeah. And then that'll give us a, a sort of a barrier guideline as to yeah, whether it's speed effective the, or not. Uh, the yeah. appearance and the speed rate. Okay. Um, any other discussion from the commission? Public? Yes. Question. Uh, quick question. Is, is there any possibility that maybe reducing the speed limit there? I know it's already 25. Is that ever going to consideration? <laughs> it would be, be ridiculous. That ain't ever going to happen. Okay. Oh, 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 the state 
Yeah, I now the State yeah. Department of Transportation sets the speed limits on there a bunch of factors, and they've determined unless there's an extreme situation that 25 mile per hour would be the uh, minimum uh, speed limit for most of the municipalities in Connecticut. That's understandable, but now that it's become more of a cut through, and it's not under the Yeah, they, they, they go by it, but it would be a Department of Transportation who sets it. The police commission can't set it or yeah. make it up. We have to petition. I'll give an example. Very similar situation. Wilson Street actually is 30 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. We petitioned the state. They did a study and they denied our request to reduce it to 25. Mm -hmm. So, wow. yeah. So, yeah, you can. Uh, yeah. I make a loose deal. We move the question because we're getting away from yeah. the yeah. line yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't see that. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we have, we have a motion to second it, uh, and no further discussion. Hearing none, uh, so the vote all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. One opposed? Okay. All right. Extension? The extension? No extension. Okay. Motion passes. Thank, thank you for thank coming. Thank you very there. much. And thank you very much. Attorney Russo, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Old business, none. New business. I want to go over the uh, motion. Go for it. Uh, new business. Recognition of donation made to the Fairfield Animal Control Shelter of $45 cash from an anonymous woman who, for the care and well being of the animals at the shelter. Uh, number two, a $50 check uh, from Donna Persley of North Brantford, Connecticut as a donation to our shelter on behalf of an animal lover. $50 check donation from Donna Persley uh, as a donation on behalf of an animal lover. And $40 cash from a five-year-old, Ella Del Vecchio. Uh, Ella came to our shelter with her mother, Jacqueline, to donate the money she raised along with several blankets for the dogs. Total donation deposit, $185. Just a quick point of order. Two and three are noting that the, there are two fifty dollar donations made with the same check number, which is check washing. That's a good, <laughs> no. that's a great point. Yeah. So I think there's like possibly an error. Double we'll look into that. Yes, I will look into that. Yeah, really. Maybe it's twenty. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to check with that federal donation 185. Do we have a motion to accept? So moved. Commissioner yeah. Stone and seconded by Commissioner Lugo. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yes, it's not. Okay. One other thing on the new business. We have uh, we have got to elect the uh, officers for uh, January. New business. So we've got to make a motion that we nominate Commissioner Amber to be the new chairman. Amber is the new chair. Second by Commissioner Lebo. Second by Lebo. All in favor, Commissioner Ambrose. Aye. 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 Any abstention? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have to let the secretary. So, who can go next to the line? Uh, Commissioner Kiley. Okay. Well, I'll make a motion for no, Commissioner Kiley. For Kiley. Okay, I'll second. Second by time. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Opposed? Okay. Congratulations, guys. Thank Starting, you. Uh, January. Twenty twenty-three. For a one-year term, correct? Yep. For a one-year one term. One-year term. January eleventh. All right. Uh, oh. Thank you, Mr. Pine. You had a very successful year, and uh, you did a great job keeping us all under control. And not only that, you keep us all well informed, and I really appreciate that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. And our secretary, Thank you, Attorney Ambrose, you did a great job here, too. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are at the monthly report. And the Commissioners, would you like to speak about um, under new business, SantaCon, before the monthly report or after yeah, the monthly yeah, report? Okay, so uh, on the new business, we're going to discuss the uh, weekend activities of SantaCon. And uh, we have a report from Captain Wyatt in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Maybe you can come up and, and elaborate a little bit. He's ready to answer any questions you may have on it. 
I've been living it the last couple of days. So. so I'm probably not going to tell you much that you haven't heard already or seen on um, social media. YouTube. Or, right. So uh, what you have in front of you is the after action report that was prepared from Sergeant Peck. Sergeant Peck was the acting shift commander on day shift as well as on evening shift. So he was there for the entirety of SantaCon. So what I can say about preparation for the event is this. Um, we were caught off guard last year by SantaCon because it was a new tradition that the students had um, started to do. So we took a look at last year's SantaCon and we also looked at how we applied lessons learned from the 2021 SantaCon to the Labor Day White Party this year. And uh, for the most part, the Labor Day White Party was handled successfully. What we did not anticipate was how the 2022 SantaCon grew to such an unreasonably large event. And uh, that could be attributed to several things, including it being uh, boosted on social media and the fact that it wasn't just a Fairfield University student event. It extended to Sacred Heart University, Quinnipiac, uh, Wesleyan, and there were um, teenagers there. So it was just something that grew out of control. So Fairfield University had hired, had attempted to hire officers to fill positions for beach patrol down there. We were able to fill two spots, and I believe two spots went unfilled. Um, the Fairfield Police Department offered to supplement with two overtime positions to have uh, dedicated beach patrol down there. Those spots did not get filled. So about four or five hours into the incident when we saw that uh, it had grown to, to a size that started to spill out into the street, Sergeant Peck made a call to start ordering officers in to work the detail down there. So on page two of the report, you can kind of look at the times and you can see the progression of, if you look at the bottom column there, total officers assigned to the beach area, you can see the progression of how we try to grow to meet the needs of this event. We started getting emails and phone calls asking us to shut the event down. That started around 2 o'clock. By 2 o'clock, the rough estimates were that there were roughly 800 to 1,000 students there. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we only had five officers assigned to the area. So my call at that time was we do not have sufficient resources to shut down this party. Let's monitor it for a couple more hours as we start to divert resources down that way and we'll reassess every half hour and that's what we did. Every half hour we reassessed how is our staff growing and how is the um, climate or the atmosphere of the party changing. So I was hoping to have to eventually get about 15 officers down there if we had to um, make that decision to shut down the party. I didn't want to make that decision with any less than 15 officers down there. As we hit uh, staffing of 10 officers down there is when the reports came in that the party started to break up on its own, which is what we anticipated was, was going to happen. So it really was just contain it, monitor it, try to assist with pedestrian and vehicular traffic, make sure that the ambulances could get in and out. And um, by six o'clock, I feel like it was mostly, mostly resolved. If Fairfield U was aware of this meeting, why should they not be expected to provide more support by way of officers, safety men, safety people, et cetera? So this uh, comes up in conversation a lot. And um, there are two schools of thought. We see the advantage in it from the standpoint of a lot of times students are more deterred from uh, certain behaviors more deterred by their fear of consequence at the university than they are fear of consequence from the police department. So we've said if you have a few Fairfield public safety cars down here and the students see that, maybe they really do think twice about engaging in, in certain behaviors. Uh, the university is very clear that it's a liability for them to put safety officers down there with an expectation that they're acting in some sort of uh, capacity or, or with some sort of uh, perceived authority over the students who are not on campus, which I understand that aspect of it as well. So 
coming to a resolution on that particular question is still in discussion. And I think both Fear for University, as we did, didn't expect a size crowd. They knew what was going on. They tried to hire um, four would have been enough. They wouldn't have needed 15. I think no one anticipated the, the size of the group. Can you identify the organizers on social media? There's really no way to identify the organizers. These things just tend to grow organically. Um, so we we'll expect this coming again next year. So planning for next year, we got Fairfield University to commit to uh, absorbing this as a sanctioned event so that they can put limitations on it the same way they did with Clam Jam. And uh, that would be extremely helpful for us as well because what sanctions we, would they put I'm sorry? What sanctions would they well, they would they would make it a Fairfield University sanctioned event, okay. like like okay. they did with Clam Jam, so that they would have authority over the other. Exactly, so that they can control things like uh, you have to be 21 or over, you have to have a pass. Anybody who shows up who does not have a pass can be turned away. That empowers us yeah. to control the the size of the event. So this past year's Clam Jam was run very successfully. So we're hoping that we'll be able to manage SantaCon next year the same way. Just, I was down there for the entire thing, and I think we were about 30 seconds away from a riot. And FBRA, 200 family members, don't feel the police were active enough or had enough presence to protect them. And they feel that's why they, that's the primary purpose of the police department. And only 10, I mean, you guys couldn't do anything because you only had 10 or 12 officers. And I'm reading what you want to do next year. For next year, it could actually be 3,000 kids down there, or 2,500. Well, the idea is by having it be a Fairford University sanctioned event, and then we can basically implement the same operational plan that we use for Clam Jam on SantaCon. We can control the numbers that way. When you, you had the Bridgeport Mounted Police at one time, you guys really had a show of force when things were bad. And there wasn't any this past weekend. And, you, I mean, not the, when they had, I don't know how many mounted police they had one time. They had a lot of them. And, I mean, it, it, it just didn't seem like the crowd was really dictating what was happening. That's not a good position. It's not a good position to be in, but it's a reality sometimes. Um, we had, so... Going back to earlier on, five to seven officers for a crowd of a thousand people. That's, that's kind of lean, right? The, the ratio is, yeah, it's a horrendous ratio. So as we were building, as we were attempting to build our forces down there, in case we finally felt that we needed to disperse it and we had sufficient resources to do so, we just didn't want to take that action prematurely and cause bigger problems. Well, I heard that that, was, that happened last time too with the Oberfest and stuff. But what happens? If the thing did get out of here, let's just say the total riot mm -hmm. bullshit went on. What, what happened? So we had uh, mutual aid on standby. We we were preparing for it, but we've seen we've seen enough of these events to know that more likely than not, it was just going to tire itself out. Yeah, but Fairfield University kids, by and large, okay. But you're getting Quinnipiac, mm -hmm. you're getting Sacred Heart, you're getting this one and that one, and I mean, how do you really know it's going to happen? You know, I mean, you really got to be prepared. Well, what, all, what all, was, yeah. Ultimately, you could have enacted the Fairfield County Bloomland, mm -hmm. which would have sent officers from all over Fairfield County heading in that direction. Bridgeport recently did it, and there were cops from everywhere. We talked about it. We just didn't think we were there oh, yet. No, no, okay. I just don't, I, we don't, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we have, uh, as Commissioner Millicent said, the uh, blue plan is uh, it's a phased plan that we have depending on the seriousness of the event or the size of the event it's kind of like a push one button to get your all of your mutual aid here as quickly as possible so and we talked about it we just didn't think we were, well, we were I think there yet by and large it was loud but they're not nasty people those kids. they weren't that nasty no I, I think that the biggest issue was um, people get upset when they see students urinating on their property rightfully so Pulling up in their driveway, uh, and they and they don't like to see officers in the street not stopping everyone with an open container and doing something about that. And I understand that as well because it looks like we're we're not doing our job. The issue was um, 
by about two o'clock, between two o'clock and five o'clock was peak mayhem of this incident when everybody had started spilling out into the street and that's when it became very obvious how many of the students had open containers. But that also coincides with the um, the amount of ambulance calls that we had. There were quite a few of those. And there were quite a few of those and I was just reading through a lot of the uh, intake remarks again today just looking at how many students were being dragged out to the street because they were unconscious and the kids didn't know what to do with them. Was it mostly alcohol or drugs? Or alcohol. Alcohol. You know, as they start building, um, you know, the public beach, um, you know, have a, the parks and rec require a thing like this fire pit. We need a permit to have a fire pit. So why do we have people on the beach yes. that not have a permit? I mean, it's private property. Or did, we yeah. private property on the point. Yeah, but below the high tide mark, is more like, it's not even town property. Yet, but mo most of the party was on private property on the on Lantern Point Beach and Lantern Point deck. Okay. Well, your ordinance is if you have so many people, you have to hire a food For sporting events and for large gatherings, yeah. So if they're having a gathering, you want to say that that was just you can shut them down so you don't please them. Well, that will change. Yeah, mm -hmm. if the university takes it over, they sell tickets, we have a head count, we know ratio of cops to, to, so to students. How, how they They're going to maybe move it to Penfield. Um, so they'll never get mm -hmm. yep. But the, the concern, we had a meeting, the concern is what splinter event comes up. Now they're being watched by the police at Clam GM and the university watched during SantaCon. What do kids want to do? They want to be kids without adult oversight, right? Mm -hmm. So do they have another event that now becomes, and they love, you know, the first 90 degree day down there on a Saturday, the parties roll out and they're, you know, gets a little out of control. So what your uh, solution is to like, as soon as they start gathering, to track down? Or how, how, how well, I mean, typically in the spring, they get us um, on a nice Saturday when we have eight cops working and all of a sudden 500 people show up at the beach and we end up with a, a problem we have to manage and it usually peaks and then goes out. One of the problems I heard, kids couldn't even get out of the beach. They couldn't even get Ubers. It was a two hour wait for Ubers. Yellow cabs were showing up to pick up kids. So the people who were trying to leave the beach couldn't even get out of the beach because it was just such a, so many people there mm -hmm. were requested to leave. So I think that probably held it at bay for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, There's just too many people. And Captain, just one, uh, with the report I know of, doesn't hear that the Fairfield Street lighting got a little bit, uh, you know, slammed as well on their way in there. But the, um, I did hear from a, a few people as well that unlike, you know, Clam Jam and stuff like that, when it's over, they leave, there was a, a lot of people that decided to then go into downtown to eat at restaurants and stuff that also created an interesting environment. Correct. And I, I think that's the effect of how many people, we saw people getting off the train, getting off the bus, um, getting out of cabs to attend this event. So there was a large number of people that we don't even know where they were coming from. So I would imagine that's the same group that went out in town and had dinner and had a few extra drinks before they actually left town. Yeah. All around that situation. <laughs> but uh, as, a, as a deterrent, well, moving forward, um, it's it's good to know that Fairfield University is willing to absorb it as a sanctioned event. And like I said, we have a great blueprint for um, Clam Jam that will apply to SantaCon next year. And uh, also as an added deterrent, G4 Security claims that they have uh, good video footage of trespassers. So if their video footage is as good as they claim it is, we're getting in contact with them and we'll work with Fairfield University to identify trespassers and we'll take appropriate action. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to proceed to pass SantaCon into the regular monthly report. <coughs> um, Deputy Chief, if you want to do some briefing here. Sure. Any questions on the monthly report? Um, we uh, we want, we just hired a new licensed uh, clinical social worker. Um, they came for a tour of the building yesterday in a meet and greet. And what's the start date? Um, Monday. Monday. She's starting. 
retired. Do you want to give a quick a little short blurb who that is? Sure. Uh, Jessica Bloomberg is our hired licensed clinical social worker. She just retired from Stanford Police Department as a police officer uh, this past Friday, 21 years Stanford PD. She had her LCSW prior to becoming a police officer, so she comes to us with uh, the best of both worlds under her belt already. So um, I really think she's going to be a plug-and-play employee. That's wonderful. That's yeah. right. One week off. <laughs> yeah, that's one week off. Yeah, <laughs> her first day in. Wow. Uh, good. I know that your speed violations uh, 1125 years to date. Very good. Stop sign 754 violations. Pretty good. The only other question is, you have a larceny theft in your statistics 202. Can you break it down to shoplifter 25 and Death Which page are you on? I'm sorry. Uh, page two of three of your incident um, report. Page two of three? Well, this is the stats here. Oh, gotcha. So you have Larkin's death 202. Two of three. Gotcha. I'm going to look at it. You break it down with shoplifting 25 and Motor Vehicle death 24. So are they additional to 202 or is that? Uh, oh, she's that. I'm sure it's uh, two or three. No, no, no. Oh, no. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm wrong here. Sorry. I got the wrong thing. I found it. Right. So okay. you have larceny theft uh, one. Larceny theft 16. Did you have. I mean, just one of the total larceny theft. So you have larceny employee theft one, larceny identity theft one, larceny theft 16. Okay. Have shop through 25, 24, so, um, you add those up, that'll be yeah, they, I think those are independent. Yeah. Okay. That's our biggest crime in What about yeah. mail thefts this time of the year? We've had a couple, um, and as well, other uh, agencies and towns, I've seen them on the news, they've had them as well. Mostly when the flag is up and they're taking the checks, flag is up for outgoing mail, checks for bills, doctoring the checks, and cashing them for different amounts. I've read a couple of those. Um, I heard about that. Our, our shoplifters are still off the hook. BJ's, Home Depot, oh daily basis, um, yeah. sometimes two, three of the day. It's, but you know, we're getting good video from the, from the stores. Um, DD's following them up. Both, basically, almost every day a bolo goes out for our email with a picture or a plate or you know, looking for somebody for something. Pretty much. Um, and you can see uh, earlier we we put our our beloved Ruger to rest. Um, the Ruger's laid to rest, and uh, we're currently doing a toy drive, which Mark Letch spearheads, Officer Letch. Um, that's being delivered on the 17th. Uh, we raised uh, $2,100, 60 through No Shave November. Uh, County Grills donating 51,000 to Police and Fire. So uh, we're getting half of that. It's going to go to Fairfield Police Foundation for officer wellness and other things in the general fund. And we're donating six thousand dollars to the uh, two lost officers from the first ball shooting. Okay. Um, Commissioner, is there anything else on the monthly report? No. Today. What's that? Motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Unless you guys have any help. Oh. We fed the we uh, fed the seniors today at the senior center. We have a senior lunch in the union, uh, so probably 20, 20 officers showed up to help. Uh, really, really good showing. And uh, we do it every year. But they love it, and we, we uh, an, an invite. It's chicken with chicken piccata. Yeah. Chicken piccata, pasta, salad, and some cookies from uh, the bakery. No. Oh, okay. It was. Uh, it, it was. A, it was actually from Boca, and Boca has. Uh, yeah, they they've done us year after year. They kind of refuse it. When I was junior president, they refuse to take money. We give them a little something to offset their costs, but they're giving us a few thousand dollars worth of food for a few hundred dollars. Very generous of Boca. Yanni Yanni tax authorities and uh, Boca. When they ran Crave, they did it. Um, they just cooked down in that kitchen, but it's the same same business. So. All right, well, there's a, there's a motion to 
to adjourn. I second. Second by Commissioner Ambrose. All in favor? Aye. Aye.